Welcome to a new component of the International Borlaug Dialogue, one of four selected interactive partner workshops. These workshops showcase amazing work going on by partners of all types, working on big challenges to provide data, technology, and the resources to reduce food insecurity in different parts of the world. All of these featured workshops offer greater interaction between our virtual participants and the various organizations that are presenting. Importantly, all the work offered today would not be possible without the diverse, strong partnerships you will see that are executing these tools and programs focused on transforming aspects of our food systems. The first workshop today is titled The Global Food Security Index, Exploring Challenges and Developing Solutions. It's hosted jointly by Corteva AgriScience and the Economist Intelligence Unit. It explores the latest findings of the 2021 index or GFSI. Launched October 12th, this year's index allows us to look at the underlying factors affecting food insecurity at the country level. You will take a quick tour through this tool and learn to navigate the masses of data of the GFSI to understand macro level problems, draw conclusions for policy and business operations, and identify research priorities to tackle food insecurity. Science, research, and innovation are vital to solving food insecurity. We hope you'll find this tool fascinating and innovative. Thank you, Corteva and The Economist, for showcasing this important work for everyone gathered today at the International Borlaug Dialogue. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Tim Glenn. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Corteva AgriScience. I lead the global team at Corteva responsible for serving millions of farmers all over the world. I'm joined by Pratima Singh, Senior Manager, Policy and Insights at Economist Impact. She's joining us from Singapore. Good afternoon, Hi. Pratima. Hi, Tim. Thanks very much for having me. Good, good morning to you. And it's our pleasure to be here and welcome all of you to this special interactive workshop during the 2021 Borlaug Dialogue about the Global Food Security Index, exploring challenges and developing solutions. Corteva AgriScience is proud to be the exclusive sponsor of the index for the 10th year in a row, making it available at no cost to everyone from the Economist Impact website. The index provides a comprehensive look at year over year changes of the factors impacting food security. It considers the issues of affordability, availability, quality, safety, natural resources, and resilience in 113 countries, providing reliable data for decision-making by governments, industry, NGOs, academics, and others to ensure food security in the future. The 2021 index was launched on October 12th, and I hope you've already downloaded the report and new index. If you haven't, please check out the link in the chat so you can follow along with us today. You've already read the report. You know that the index shows that food security has been on the decline for the past two years. This comes after eight years of consistent improvement and despite significant advancements in technology across the food chain. Factors like extreme weather, growing pressures on farmers and natural resource depletion are impacting sustainable production and food security worldwide. This is a borderless problem that needs our attention. And while all of us have a role to play in addressing food security, solutions begin with farmers who help feed all of us. Farmers are continually being asked to grow significantly more food with fewer resources and increasing scrutiny from society. And the global COVID-19 pandemic has put pressure not only on farmers, but on the entire food system. Today, we're going to explore the latest report, which focuses on taking action. At Corteva, we're focused on doing just that through our actions and commitments that align with our purpose to enrich the lives of those who produce and those who consume. I'm gonna share three examples of how we're doing that. First, we're focused on providing innovative products and solutions to farmers that help them produce quality products while meeting personal goals for their operations. Second, we have set 2030 sustainability goals to protect and preserve the source of our food and help communities thrive. This includes training millions of farmers on soil health, and nutrient and water managed stewardship and best management practices. 
And third, we're collaborating with farmer groups, NGOs, and policymakers to advocate for enabling environments such as practical science-based policies and regulatory systems to ensure that farmers can have certainty and understanding of market and trade opportunities. But as you'll see today, the GFSI shows we have more to do because hunger is still prevalent across the world. To that point, let's start with the first audience poll question. I'm gonna show the question and ask that you type your response in the chat. So the question is, in 2020, what percentage of the global population was estimated to be moderately to severely food insecure? You have three options to choose from, 15%, 30%, and 40%. So please take a second and type your response in the chat. So as the answers come in, um, the, the answer is actually 30%. So Pratimo, with that number in mind, I'm gonna hand over to you to take us through a tour of the index, what it is and how it can help raise awareness and we can take action to improve food security. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, the number, the percentage of the global population that was moderate to severely in food insecure in 2020 is 30%, which is a large number, a very striking number uh, to start off with. And so really talking back to the point of how this needs to be a concern for policymakers, the private sector, uh, and civil society going forward. And with that in mind, I want to take you through the Global Food Security Index, the uh, 10th edition of the Food Security Index that allows us to see uh, some key findings, year-on-year -year trends, as well as 10-year trends. Uh, really allowing us to deepen our understanding of the drivers of food insecurity. So let's start with what is the GFSI and, and what we're really trying to measure uh, through this index. So uh, to start with, as I mentioned, uh, we launched this index. The first edition was launched in 2012. So this year, the GFSI 2021 is in fact its 10th year. Uh, and we started off uh, a little bit more simply, uh, of course, uh, supported by Corteva AgriScience from the beginning. The GFSI started with about 105 countries back in 2020, uh, 2012, and we've expanded the index to include more and more countries because what the GFSI allows us to do is really examine uh, the, in, the enabling environment for food security from a global perspective across these 113 countries and provides a set of best practices, tools, benchmarks for countries to measure progress, and really an actionable roadmap uh, for policymakers uh, as they look to achieve the uh, SDG goal to zero hunger. Um, all of this information, I'm sure uh, you've seen, is available on the Economist Impact website. Uh, feel free to download all the resources so you can follow us today as we take you through the insights. As mentioned, the uh, Food Security Index, Global Food Security Index, is a quantitative and qualitative benchmarking tool, and it's constructed using a framework that includes 58 indicators, uh, and it's categorized uh, by four pillars. These four pillars allow us to uh, examine and explore the enabling environment uh, for different countries to achieve food security. And this is, of course, applicable to both developing and developed countries. These four pillars are affordability, availability, quality and safety, and natural resources and resilience. And it's really important to look at all four together in a holistic way to examine those drivers of hunger uh, and underlying causes and underlying factors that are determining food insecurity. Last year in 2020, we added this fourth pillar of natural resources and resilience into the core index. So we added it as a fourth pillar because we, we found that it was no longer um, possible to have a conversation on food security without talking about sustainability and risks to the natural environment. And so by including this as part of that uh, core index, we're hoping to inextricably link the conversation on food security with that of sustainable food systems. All right, let's dive into what are some of those key findings from the 2021 index. At a very high level, the overall picture uh, shows that global food security or the environment for global food security has deteriorated marginally for the second year in a row. We saw uh, a, a slight dip even last year in 2020, and we've seen a further deterioration in 2021. 
This is after years of, of improvement uh, from 2012 all the way through to 20, 2019. In terms of leaders and laggards, uh, we see that it's unsurprising, but uh, high level, high income countries um, in Europe continue to lead the index. They take up uh, about seven of the 10 spots in the top 10, uh, while the other side, in, in contrast, Sub-Saharan African nations continue to dominate the bottom ranks of the index and take up seven of those of the bottom 10 places. So essentially we've seen a little bit of that regional um, uh, shift or regional uh, aspects play out as well. But rather than just talking about what we're seeing, we want to dive in a little deeper and see why we're seeing this decline, why some of these dips are in fact taking place, especially in the past two years. Well, Let's break this down by category and look at what's happening in the four pillars. So on average, you'll see that the global food security environment score for 113 countries is about 60.9. Uh, but you'll see how the different pillars are actually different, scoring differently. So to start with, of course, we see quality and safety is the highest scoring pillar. Uh, but what really was the driver of that decline in 2020 and, and 2021 uh, was the deterioration in affordability that improved from 2012 through to 16, uh, but in the last few years has seen a deterioration. And this is really important and a specific point we want to flag because affordability of food is very closely correlated and linked to prevalence of hunger and other uh, metrics around undernourishment, uh, like stunting in children under five. So it's important that this is a metric we continue to improve on. The second pillar that I want to flag is in fact natural resources and resilience. Again, here you'll see that this is the pillar that is uh, on the other end of the spectrum from quality and safety, because it is the lowest scoring pillar uh, almost across all countries. And it's important to note that the average overall score is 60 versus the average overall score in this pillar is 50.8, which is a whole 10 points lower than what we see on average. And this is really important to, to understand because we can see that this is an area that all countries have to focus on. Uh, other factors like um, availability continue to also be, the availability is the third uh, scoring uh, pillar here, and there are specific uh, aspects of availability that we need to continue to uh, focus on in order to uh, really move the needle in ensuring that uh, all of these other aspects of food security, including natural resources, quality and safety, as well as affordability, continue to improve. In terms of what's going on at a, uh, by, in a group, uh, by breaking it down by income groups, what we see over the 10 years is that there is a very strong correlation between um, income levels and, of course, um, food security. We do see, though, that there is still progress to be made across all income groups in the food security index. We see that um, overall, low-income countries have, have improved, uh, and their progress is also uh, I guess moderating a little bit. However, high income countries that had previously made substantial gains in the index have started uh, almost plateauing, if not declining, in their overall food security environment. And really, so the message here is that it's important to look at, um, uh, even in high income countries, to look at the issue of food security, because what we can see is that over 80% of the countries in, high, in the high income group improved their score from 2012 to 16. And then since then, we've seen a, a, a plateau or decline. And the reason for this is that there has been a dramatic or a, a substantial uh, drop or decline in the focus on agricultural R&D across the board, but in particular in high income countries. And so as we face challenges with climate volatility, this continues to be an area that needs to be prioritized going forward. Looking at it from a regional lens, we see that um, North America and Europe continue to lead the index in terms of um, their overall scores. I mentioned that uh, Europe has seven out of the 10 top spots. North America, which comprises the US and Canada in our index, continues to be the top ranking region uh, but, but, and followed very closely by Europe. Um, on, the other high, on the other end of the spectrum, we see Sub-Saharan Africa at the bottom uh, with a lot of room for improvement. 
In the middle there, along the average of uh, our overall global food security index scores as well, we see the regions of Middle East and North Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. And so what we find is that there's still a lot of space between the regions. We are seeing some clustering. And, and in, in, uh, in an effort to improve food security, all regions need to prioritize um, uh, figuring out and, and managing the drivers, such as affordability, availability, quality, as well as natural resources. So uh, just before I show you the model quickly, uh, I want to highlight a few learnings that we've um, seen in the past 10 years of doing this, this data collection, measurement, and analysis. What we see is there are some big shifts and changes in certain countries' environments for improving food security. On the left hand side, you'll see countries that have significantly improved their operating and their, their uh, food security environment. Uh, and on the right hand side, you'd see countries where this has declined quite uh, dramatically. Tanzania, China, Cambodia, um, Kenya, some of these countries really improved affordability by boosting market access, improving food safety nets, and driving food costs down. And on the other side, you'll see Venezuela, Burundi, and Brazil. These countries actually have experienced higher uh, food costs as a result of which their performance in the food security um, uh, index deteriorated. And in particular, we see even for Brazil and Venezuela, Venezuela was obviously impacted by a tremendous conflict, uh, while Brazil also faced uh, issues around sufficiency of supply and volatility of agricultural production. Uh, finally, we see some improvements uh, uh, in the Middle East as well with Algeria, the UAE, and Pakistan improving some metrics on the availability side of things uh, by, by improving sufficiency of supply and uh, by prioritizing their commitments to food security. Uh, I want to show you, take this opportunity to show you the model at a very high level before we dive deeper and answer some questions on this. All of this information that I've just highlighted is available through our GFSI model. Uh, so you will be able to see countries that are um, in the top by, so I did mention seven out of the 10. We see, you can play around with this to see which countries score at the top. You see which countries are at the bottom end of the index as well. And there is a big difference between the top scorer, Ireland, and countries at the bottom, like Burundi and Yemen, that score one third of the points that we see for uh, some of the top scoring countries. We can also break down the index and go deeper into each individual uh, indicator, the 58 indicators, uh, by playing around under the Series Explorer tab, looking at specific countries by uh, picking and choosing um, certain metrics on where they, how they performed under each individual category, comparing categories as well, uh, countries as well, I beg your pardon. And then finally, also doing a little bit of analysis by looking at things like a scatter plot that allows us to look at the correlations of different uh, indicators of the overall scores with other metrics. So for instance, I'll leave you with this before I hand back to Tim. Uh, we can look at things like the overall food security environment and hunger metrics. I mentioned stunting. So let's look at how that relates. And you can see here a very strong negative correlation between the overall food security environment and the percentage of children that are stunted. It's a very strong negative 83. And so we know that by improving the overall food security environment, uh, we can uh, uh, potentially bring down this number quite, quite significantly. So I'll, I'll leave you with that for now and uh, hand back to Tim uh, to take us through some uh, conversation and dialogue. All right, very good. And thanks for the overview, uh, Pratima. You know, clearly a very powerful tool, um, deep data resource, and, and again, available to everyone right now. So before you um, kind of guide us through how to do a deeper dive, maybe we can take some um, real life examples on how the index can be used by attendees in their own country. So uh, maybe start off here, uh, you know, in honor of our 2021 food World, or World Food Prize laureate, uh, Dr. Tilston, you know, let's start with Denmark. So as our attendees know, Dr. Tilston is a native of Trinidad and Tobago and a citizen of Denmark, and she's being recognized for her groundbreaking research in aquaculture and food systems. So, so overall, Denmark ranks 17th in the index, and the country has a very high ranking on affordability and quality and safety, uh, but is number 43 on availability, and that's a drop of 12 places since the last index. Can, can you talk through where to find these stats on the model and what it might mean for decision makers in Denmark? 
Absolutely, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, it's obviously top of mind. We did mention that uh, Europe tends to do well, but let's take a deeper dive into this country. Uh, we can go into the model and look at uh, the homepage. Once you download the model, this is the, the screen that pops up on your page. Uh, we click on Explore the Index, and this is where you're able to see all the different countries' rankings across the four pillars and on the overall environment. So let's pick Denmark, as you mentioned, and see where it lies on the index. As you mentioned, 17th place uh, in the overall food security environment. Excellent in terms of affordability. It's ranking number one here. On the third pillar of quality and safety, we see it's number five. And on the natural resources pillar, it's number 25 out of 130. Uh, all of these are relatively good. Uh, and to your point, it does rank you have to scroll down in the model, which means it ranks a little bit lower uh, on the second pillar of availability. It's number 43. In fact, between 2020 and 2021, it's dropped 12 places and decreased by uh, 3.5 points. Let's play around with the, the year, the comparison year. So let's look at 2012. So over the 10 year period of the index, uh, what did we see for Denmark? Uh, we saw, of course, it's 17 this year, but it's still it's dropped 25 places between 2012 and 2021. So it's seen a significant decline in this particular category. Uh, and so we want to kind of uh, examine really what's driving this. And the way that we can do that using the index is really looking at country profiles. So we go into this third tab on country profiles and then pick Denmark, and you be seeing it loading on your screen in just a second. The comparison year, as you see here, is 2012, uh, and we can see the overview. As you see here, it's improved in affordability. I mentioned that it is doing rather well on that. Um, it's done well in quality and safety, made small improvements, so there's still room to grow and improve uh, in the fourth category of natural resources but it has declined by 6.9, almost seven points in the availability category. And what's driving this, you'll see there are some red boxes here, which means that this, this is very weak uh, particular uh, sub indicators here. Uh, of course, there's improvements to food, uh, food loss that can be improved. Uh, and in particular, volatility of agricultural production needs to be a big focus for policymakers going forward. It's, it's dropped by 46.6 points. This is essentially looking at how much, how volatile and how predict, unpredictable um, the, the agricultural production has been for a particular country. So we know that this is uh, an area of focus uh, that needs to be prioritized. We can even come under the compare countries page tab and, and check what how Denmark is doing with another country in Europe. Maybe uh, let's pick well, the Netherlands, for instance, and see how it ranks or compares against a country like the Netherlands. And again, you'll see here total rank 17 versus the Netherlands, that's at six. It does tremendously better than uh, the Netherlands in affordability. Availability needs to be prioritized uh, and pretty close around quality and safety and some room to improve for, uh, uh, for natural resources and resilience. And so, I want to bring that natural resources and resilience up because we can see that both Netherlands and um, uh, Denmark have a lot of space to improve in this particular indicator. And it's not just these two countries. One of the things we've seen is that this is a uh, space and indicator of particular factor that can be improved in a number of countries. So for instance, uh, let's look at this map that showcases volatility of agricultural production. Uh, for for the, the countries that we cover, the 113 countries that we see, and you'll see that there's there's some reds here in Europe, in, in Australia, as well as parts of Africa. And so this is really a space and a, a particular metric that needs to be prioritized going forward. And we see that, that there are signs that this uh, needs to be fixed because we're seeing agricultural research and development spending and investment declining. Uh, while we see risks to um, the climate and variability increasing. 
And so uh, it's really critical that we are able to prioritize building resilience to some of these shocks um, in order to make sure that we are protected uh, against some of these risks that are impending and that are very likely to, to uh, come up in the short term rather than the long term anymore. This is the metric on natural resources and resilience, which is the fourth category. And you'll see the very few green spots here and a lot of room to improve. I want to hand back to you, Tim, but maybe I'll pose a question to you in return, if I may. Um, I know you're, you're speaking to farmers every day and, and you're traveling around the world. I, I'd like to maybe post, ask you, how are you seeing this resilience play out uh, on the ground and around the world uh, in your conversations with farmers? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, farmers... Farmers deal with a lot of, um, you know, credible challenges and uncertainty um, every every day, and um, you know, throughout seasons, across years, there's there's new and ever changing environments that they're dealing with, and you know, they can be, you know, things like weather, um, you know, markets, whether it's price or or access to markets, um, could be pre pest pressure, um, things that they've dealt with in the past, or or new pressures, um, or maybe more structural issues around access to capital or, or um, you know, in, in infrastructure within their local market. And so, you know, I, I think farmers are very special individuals. And as, as a group and collectively, you know, I think that they, they would not, they're would they not able to do what they do without having that uh, ability to overcome, ability to deal with that adver adversity. And so, you know, and, and, and when you consider layer, layering on the challenge we've had over the past two years with COVID-19, certainly, um, everything I just mentioned before was was magnified just because of some of the challenges that that uh, they were having either from a personal standpoint or within their communities uh, as well. So, um, you know, it, it, it is something that's absolutely critical. And, and, you know, in terms of how farmers deal with things, how they overcome, you know, it's a constant learning process. Um, you know, that, that, that pursuit of, of new technologies, new practices that, that, that will make them more economically sustainable, sustainable from an environmental standpoint and ensure that their operations are gonna be um, successful, not just this year, not just next year, but over the course of a generation. You know, farmers take that generational review, that, that generational view. And um, as you think about resilience, you know, they have to be able to deal with those short-term challenges like the weather and certainly be, at, be in a position where they can be, you know, effective in the long run. And, it, and it's through that constant learning, constant improvement and constant building of their operations that they do it. And, and, I, and I see that with smallholder farmers around the world and I see it with some of the largest, most sophisticated operations. You know, in, in my role, I get to work with, you know, every range of, of farmers on, on every continent. And um, it's an incredible ability of, of farmers to, to have that resiliency to overcome and, and continue to um, dr move forward and, and help support the growth around the world. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. No, that. That, that, and I appreciate the question. So maybe maybe I'll ask a question that, that came in from the audience here. And, mm -hmm. and um, I, I mentioned technology is one of the factors that uh, farmers are using. And, and um, w when you think of the role of technology in terms of really impacting uh, food security. Um, how do you how do you think things have ha played out over the last ten years, and maybe what do you see the role of technology in the in the coming ten years? Mm -hmm. um, really, really critical question, and very much something that we're monitoring very closely because we do know that innovation and technological developments are really the key to solving this crisis around you know producing more food in a sustainable way. To, and, and nutritious food to be able to feed our populations. And so uh, those are important metrics that we're looking at as well. You'll be able to see that we've been looking at that from uh, a perspective of um, agricultural R&D, as I mentioned. Um, this includes um, technology and um, access to um, agricultural technology, education and resources here. Uh, lots of room to, to grow here. I'm going to pull up to the uh, rankings page so you can see um, how this is playing out. Um, we've got some countries that have improved overall between 2012 and 2021, 20, uh, uh, but there are still some red spots here. And so there is a lot of room uh, for improvement in this particular indicator. And of course, overall in ag uh, agricultural research and development technology is a big component in that. Uh, and so you'll see there's quite a bit of red. So several countries have in fact 
deteriorated. More countries have deteriorated in this particular indicator than have improved uh, over the past 10 years. So we know that this is an important area that needs to be prioritized. Um, and then, of course, we've also got other metrics that uh, include this, such as access to mobile data and banking. There we see countries making significant efforts. So I would say that overall, we're seeing some improvements in particularly uh, more uh, simple uh, tools that, that are provided. There still needs to be a lot more work on uh, more, uh, I guess, innovative and sustainability linked, um, uh, I guess, uh, tools that can uh, enable farmers uh, to produce more, uh, more efficiently. Uh, but the other thing that I would highlight here is the access to financial services that needs to come along with this, as well as education, because it's not something that can be looked at in isolation. Yep, absolutely. No, I appreciate that. And so, you know, let's let's maybe talk about um, a success story here. So the GFSI report showed that uh, Tanzania was a country with the most improved food security environment. Um, its score incre increased by about 13 points between 2012 and 2021, and it rose 21 places to 86th position overall. You know, it's a lower middle income nation that's dominated by smallholder farming. And can you tell us how they achieved that progress and, and what they should do to keep the positive momentum? And are there, are there takeaways that are uh, relevant for other countries? Yes, absolutely. I think Tanzania has been a really interesting example to, to monitor and to, to analyze over the past few years. Uh, I'm going to pull up my screen where you should be able to see the GFSI website so I can show you how we can, um, you know, uh, I guess, dissect some of this information online as well. So we could go into baseline index and explore countries. Uh, this will allow us to have a deep dive into actually all 113 countries, but let's, for the sake of time, uh, jump right into answering your question uh, and, and looking at Tanzania here. Tanzania, as you mentioned, improved significantly. It is now ranking 86 um, it, with 48. So there's still a lot of room to grow out of 100, still uh, relatively low uh, in terms of the ranking, uh, but, but it's made significant progress. Um, so if you look here, these are the ranks in the individual of, uh, categories. You will see uh, it's, it's still lagging behind in natural resources and affordability, some improvements in availability, and, and still some room to grow, grow in uh, quality and safety. Uh, what you'll see here is essentially uh, it's made some significant commitments to food security, and that's really helped in improving its availability uh, score. You can also kind of go down here and explore uh, an interesting tool that we play with uh, in order to visualize some of this data. So here we've got Tanzania highlighted along with uh, its um, regional peers in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see the, the overall score and maybe how it does in affordability because we know that affordability is an area that can improve. So here you'll see how this is quite closely linked in Tanzania somewhere along that line uh, in, in improving its food security. So it's got, uh, it's got room to grow both ways and move to the top right hand corner. Let me uh, jump into the model again quickly to show you um, exactly what's happened in Tanzania and what we can learn from it uh, in the, uh, as, as for other countries. What are the learnings that, that can be extrapolated here? So let's select Tanzania here, check that the comparison year is 2012. We see the overall score of 48, as you mentioned, improved by 13.3 points, which is a tremendous uh, improvement uh, over the past 10 years. Um, natural resources has unfortunately declined, and so we know that there are still uh, improvements that can be made here, uh, particularly around political commitment to agricultural adaptation. Um, it's improved in availability by 19 points. Uh, as you can see here, it's sort of on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to uh, what we have seen for Denmark, where volatility was very high. It's managed to curb and contain some of that volatility, uh, and that needs to continue being a focus going forward. But really where we've seen the most improvements for Tanzania are in the affordability category. And in particular, of course, we've seen improvements in food safety nets and also market access. But in particular, we've seen improvements in average food costs. We've seen that the, um, uh, the, the, the country has been able to manage this and curtail this because we know for a fact that high food costs are very closely linked to 
food insecurity. And so it's managed to bring that down to its population. Uh, that's allowed um, the, the country to improve in food security, uh, as well as improving uh, things like sufficiency of supply uh, in order to make sure that everyone is achieving uh, as, as high uh, uh, an adequate caloric intake as necessary uh, in, the, in the country. So those are a couple of, I guess, um, uh, reasons why Tanzania has improved and kind of what we highlighted in the presentation as well. Um, you know, we've seen it driving food costs down, improving access and food safety nets, uh, and then uh, things like sufficiency of supply. These are some metrics and these are some areas that countries can focus on and learn from in order to improve their food security environments going forward. No, that's great. Um, excellent again and a great example and really highlights the depth and, uh, and, and uh, utilization of the, of the data there. So I want to take us in maybe a little bit different direction here. So you know, just last week on October 15th, we celebrated International Day of Rural Women. Um, day was established by the United Nations to recognize the critical role and contribution of rural women in producing food, building agricultural and rural development worldwide. And you know, I'm proud to be the executive sponsor of the Women's Inclusion Network at Corteva. And, and we believe that inclusion, diversity, and equity is important not only for women employees, but also for women farmers and all women who work up and down the food value chain. Um, so I'd like to uh, open up a question for the, uh, for the uh, audience here, a uh, poll question. And, and uh, the question is around gender equity in agriculture. So. How many countries have improved in gender, in gender inequality since the first iteration of the index in 2012? So really important question here. We've got three options, 25%, 45%, and 96%. So let's take a second and, and uh, type your answers into the chat, please. So, so this answer surprised me um, in a very positive way, and the answer is 96%. So, you know, based off of surveys and feedback we've heard from rural women, 96% feels quite high. We know that there are challenges uh, in, in different parts of the world in terms of women getting fair access to information technology and certainly resources. You know, can you show us what the findings are for this relatively new indicator? And, and, and what can we learn from the 2021 index regarding the impacts of COVID on gender inequality? Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, this is an indec indicator that we, in fact, included um, in the 2020 index for the first time. Uh, and uh, because essentially we, we know for a fact that uh, gender inequality is very strongly correlated to food insecurity. And so we wanted to make sure that we're incorporating this social barrier to food security as part of our index as well, uh, in order to really, as it is a very core driver or factor of food insecurity. So last year, we, we uh, updated the framework and changed the methodology to include this indicator. Uh, and what we do in, when we include a new indicator is essentially we uh, backdate all of our scores as well to make sure that we're uh, in enabling year on year growth or performance uh, evaluation. And so we essentially made sure that we uh, updated the entire model and all the scores in order to reflect the updated um, uh, methodology. So with that, I'll show you the findings of, of what we found uh, as a result of uh, gender inequality, including this metric, uh, but also what we're seeing in gender inequality uh, across the world. Like you said, the 96% the uh, is a really interesting number, simply because, um, I mean, there's still a lot of uh, work to be done on this particular uh, uh, factor. So I'll start by showing you, this is sort of the map where you can see how countries fare or score in the gender inequality metric. Um, and, and so here you see the countries that are dark green are obviously doing better uh, uh, with the yellow and the orange uh, spaces um, where, where there's much more room to grow. So uh, there is still a wide variation between the countries that are doing uh, significantly better and those that are uh, still lagging behind. And I'll show you this by, by highlighting what we're seeing sort of as the top performers. We see, of course, again, a lot of European countries here, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, scoring 97, uh, while uh, on the other end of the spectrum, countries like Chad and Yemen and Mali, they score only 20. So one thing to note here is that that 96, of course, we're seeing improvements. And you'll see on the right-hand side, the countries that have made significant improvements since 2012 on this particular metric. Uh, but that said, 
there is a wide difference between the countries that are leading this and the countries that are lagging behind. And so we know, like you mentioned, that improving gender equality in, in uh, rural areas is critical in order to promote food security. And so I'll show you a little bit on the ranking as well. As you can see, most countries have improved um, on this uh, metric. There are some reds in here, uh, and those countries need to prioritize um, improving gender inequality. And the reason for that is, I'll show you here, something that uh, we know is, is uh, very significantly correlated to overall food security, uh, because as you can see on this particular a scatter plot, um, I beg your pardon, gender inequality, you'll see that there's a very strong correlation between gender inequality and overall food security. And it's a negative correlation. So the more unequal a society is, uh, negative 0.8%. Um, so the more unequal a society is, the more likely there will be food uh, uh, insecure. And so we know that gender inequality has deteriorated as a result of COVID. Women tend to be uh, more uh, affected by economic shocks. We see this all the time, uh, whether it's uh, economic shocks because of lack of safety nets, because of um, a lack of, um, because of supply chain bottlenecks as a result of COVID or any restrictions, uh, women tend to be more employed in the informal sector as well. So all of these factors exacerbate the pressures and the stress on, on rural women in particular. And so we can, we've seen Seen that this has in fact deteriorated um, following COVID, and it's a really important metric to prop up in order to improve the overall food security environment. That's great, and uh, I think it. Uh, I think we can feel good about the progress. Ninety-six percent is a great number, but uh, we still have a long way to go, as the map and the data uh, highlighted. So, uh, really appreciate the context there. So. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll switch to um, some audience questions here. We've got uh, several that that have that have come through. So, you know, one, one question here is around how do we ensure that the GFSI evaluates all people? You know, it's well known that uh, that that uh, the data is only as good or accurate as the process for collecting it. And and how do you evaluate food insecurity among people who don't have access to to the survey tools? Is the data disproportionately representing certain demographics? Mm -hmm. Very interesting question and also something that um, is, is very much something we've been uh, examining because the, the, the index is as good as the quality of the data. Uh, and so what I want to highlight here is this is a, a tool or an index that's determining the driving factors of food insecurity. So what we're trying to examine are what are those specific uh, areas that allow a population to be food secure or not there or lack thereof. And it's all based on the Rome Convention, the summit in 96 that talks about, um, you know, how all people need to have equal uh, access to safe, healthy, nutritious food that is affordable. Uh, and so it's all based on that. And what we're trying to do is really examine those drivers in the context of the of food security and, and for these 113 countries. And there are a couple of different ways in which we ensure that we're capturing the, uh, the entire population and it's not just representing one particular sort of group or segment. Uh, well, basically we look at, of course, quantitative metrics that, that are that we're basically gathering from the FAO, uh, from the UN and other, other places that aggregate this data. And so we know they collect it through surveys that are run over time and of course in partnership with governments as well. And then the second uh, sort of metric or type of metric group of met, uh, indicators that we use are called qualitative indicators, where essentially, essentially we're looking at whether countries have specific policies in place, whether they have certain standards in place, that we then have a team of researchers that um, go into individual websites to examine whether there is evidence of this, uh, and, and, and then populating the index with that updated data. So essentially what we're trying to do is uh, really spend time in looking for the right types of indicators from the right sources uh, at the right time to ensure that we're making this as holistic as possible in, a, in an effort to measure the drivers rather than the outcomes of food security. Yep. No, oh, very good. Thanks for the, thanks for going deep on that. And when we're doing well, I think we'll have time for one more question uh, from the audience here. So, um, you know, in terms of a uh, question here around just so, just sort of uh, maybe a difference between the food security index and and, uh, and and other sources. So, you know, according to the FAO, core pillars of the food security used to be around availability, access, stability, and utilization. 
And when you look at um, quality and natural res or natural resilience in terms of, of uh, GFSI, um, you know, should we think of this as an upgrade on that curriculum or is it really specific to the GFSI? Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, it is specific in the sense that we know that, uh, that there is a need to make uh, our food system much more sustainable. And so we know that this is not something that we're doing in isolation. This is the, the everyone is calling for, for more sustainable food systems. We've used the 96 World Food Summit definition uh, and incorporated uh, natural resources because uh, it's, it's important that we don't think of these issues in isolation. Uh, we know that natural resources and risks uh, of, uh, as a result of climate change are impacting farmers. We know that that affects their ability to produce food, but we also know that farmers tend to be some of the most food insecure people uh, in the world. And so by incorporating this, what we are essentially aiming to do is ensure that those two dialogues do not happen in a way that sort of, uh, that's connected, but, but sort of linked, uh, rather than making sure that we can in, in, uh, extricably link these two issues uh, and make sure that we're talking about this in a way that is much more cohesive rather than in silos. And so I would say it's, uh, it's an effort to make sure that we're building a more sustainable and secure food system. Okay, well, let's maybe take one more uh, second here and ask another question. I think we'll be able to slip one more in here. So, you know, many of our viewers today uh, might have attended the earlier session uh, on research and development where the Corteva uh, chief technology officer talked about regulatory certainty and mm -hmm. what does the index tell us about R&D and the importance of regular, re regulatory certainty in terms of food security? Yeah. So we, we do incorporate um, R&D as well as regulatory uh, factors. So you'll see here the regulatory environment and also uh, whether people, it's not just about having food available, it's also whether people can have access to that available food uh, in order to determine food security. And so we do incorporate things like political and social barriers to access that includes a number of different metrics, uh, say political stability risk that is of course very closely linked uh, to regulatory certainty and, or lack thereof in certain countries. And here you will see in the map, of course, uh, some some a snapshot, I guess, of of uh, regulatory risk or political stability risk. Um, we also, of course, look at things like uh, armed conflict. We know that armed conflict is a big, big factor in driving uh, food insecurity in a lot of countries. And then I'm going to move to the last one, which is corruption. And there you'll be able to see some of these countries uh, where you have very low risk for countries like Canada and Australia. And here are some of the overview changes that you can see. Uh, Australia, Canada, countries that have been significantly uh, strong in this environment. Uh, but I do wanna call out some countries that have improved uh, quite a bit over, over the last 10 years in this. And so you see uh, countries like Colombia, uh, improving. Colombia is in fact a case study in our research report as well, where we talk about the benefits of having a more stable and less corrupt government uh, in order to uh, improve um, food security. And so uh, it's, it's a very critical factor, regulatory certainty and political risk, uh, and one that we incorporate uh, in order to link to, of course, things like technology, but also overall food security. No, oh, that's great. So uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, and, and you've provided you know great number of insights today, and and, and clearly we have a lot more to uh, explore. So one more one more question for the audience here, and um, I think this is an easy one because there's no right or wrong answer, uh, but but from each individual, what what do you see as the most important of the four categories um, as being most urgent for your country in terms of addressing food security? So you know we think about affordability, availability quality and safety, natural resources and resilience. So maybe maybe take a second and, and uh, if you can type your answers into the chat. And I think we'll see lots of views on that question. And, uh, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. It really is about stimulating discussion and, and continuing the dialogue as we move forward. So Pradima, you shared you know, tremendous amount of information today. You've helped demonstrate the value and, and, and impact that this, this tool can have. Um, do you want to share any last comments um, to uh, to our audience today? 
Yeah, I, I want to, uh, well, first of all, thank, uh, thank everyone. Thank Ojava for, for sponsoring this index for the past 10 years. Uh, I want to thank our audience for taking the time uh, and, and spending this, this morning with us uh, talking about a, a critical issue like food security. Um, uh, please visit the website for more details. We, we want to make sure that this information is used. Uh, and, and so please download the model. I hope this was helpful in, in explaining how we can use this tremendous, tremendous amount of data. Uh, and I kind of just like leave you with a thought that we've made improvements, uh, but we need to continue. Uh, we're, we're seeing some um, slowdown, if not a decline. And so uh, it's critical that we continue making more progress uh, as we look to solving um, and achieving the uh, uh, UN SDG of zero hunger in the next 10 years. We've seen what's happened in the past 10 years and we need to uh, reverse some of the declines that we're seeing in order to uh, improve this environment going forward. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Over back to you, Tim. Hey, thanks, Pranima. And, and uh, just looking at the chat, seeing a lot of discussion around uh, maybe two, two points, uh, two of the pillars really stand out, um, quality and safety, and it seems like natural resources and resilience uh, have, have stood out there. So um, really, once again, um, thanks for the insight and discussion today, Pratima. You know, it really is a great reminder, the urgency, the importance of this issue for people everywhere. I, I want to take a moment again and thank our audience for taking the time to join us today. You know, I, I invite you to continue to collaborate with us and each other by bringing in innovations forward that help farmers and, and really working together to apply meaningful science-based solutions to the growing crisis that are faced by people worldwide. I want to thank the World Food Prize for this week um, dialogue and and and, for, uh, and especially for including this important topic, and, and really congratulations for a great week of important discussions. And, and finally, one last reminder: if you haven't already, please download the report that's listed in the chat. Um, I, I think you've seen the importance, the significance, and the and the amount of uh, information that's shared there. So, you know, Corteva's honored to sponsor the Global Food Security Index once again. We're honored to host you today. Uh, because now more than ever, we need to spotlight this issue and renew our collective commitment to innovation and collaboration for a better food system. Once again, thank you and have a nice day. Mm -hmm.